Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to Sixth Week here at the Oxford Union. My name is James Price and I'm the president this term. Mike Schrofer, who is the CTO of Facebook. Mike, thank you so much for joining us. And I believe you've got some opening remarks to kick this evening off. I do, James. First of all, thanks for having me. And I also wanted to thank uh, Molly Mantle and Dara Sanwal and, and the rest of the Oxford Union team for the opportunity to take part in this. Um, I was just going to say a, a few things to sort of frame up the discussion. Uh, and then I'm excited to get to everyone's questions. I mean, uh, getting to speak about the future and where it's going with everyone here who are going to be a huge part in building that future is one of the most fun parts of my work. Uh, so I can't wait to talk to you. You know, I've been in the tech industry for over two decades. And in that time, I've seen public perception and understanding technology move in waves. And they usually start with a sort of unquestioning optimism. And then they go to cynical pessimism with sort of every click in between. And I think one of the things that's striking to me is, is it feels like we're in a very pessimistic phase in general. People are losing faith that the future can be better than the past. And there's also a sense that maybe the costs of new technologies may outweigh their benefits. So if I can get through one thing tonight, it's to resist that urge to doubt the possibility of a better future through technological advancement. I hope I can convince you that the next 10 years is gonna be an incredibly exciting time to be alive, perhaps the best decade yet for technological progress. Now, the reason I think this is there are many technologies that have been developed that are on the cusp of wide adoption that you all will see in the 2020s that will impact your lives greatly. I'm talking about things like computational biology, gene editing, virtual reality, autonomous vehicles, high-speed internet access available worldwide, batteries powering basically everything, and of course, artificial intelligence. Now, given limited time, I wanna focus in on AI or artificial intelligence because it's a field that's made really stunning advancements in the last 10 years, and I think it's just gonna get better over the next decade. It's gonna power things that we can't even imagine today. Now, we've seen this pattern of innovation before, Inventions are often built in prior work. And when we sort of unlock these new foundational technologies, the best part is all the things that get built on top. If you look at the events of just last year, it took scientists less than 40 hours to map the COVID-19 genome. And using that data, it took another scientist just two days to design a vaccine. Within 45 days, we were testing it. And now more than 100 million people around the world have been given their first dose. Now, this speed was only possible thanks to decades of prior work, such as high throughput genome sequencing, lipid nanotechnology, and of course, mRNA. We went from an unknown virus to an international vaccine campaign four times faster than the prior fastest vaccine development. And this was enabled by a whole stack of new inventions developed in the decades prior. Technological advances laying the groundwork for future sudden breakthroughs is not new. Why did human flight become a possibility in the early 1900s when it had been dreamed about for centuries, maybe millennia? What was missing was the internal combustion engine, which wouldn't have existed without centuries of prior art and everything from metallurgy to the steam engine. And until those enabling technologies exist, we can't even imagine what we would do with them. And that's where your future comes in. Artificial intelligence is currently changing the way computing works in the same way that steam engines changed heavy industry. We're not talking about incremental small changes or advances in processing power. We're talking about a fundamental shift in what's possible. I've seen this firsthand at Facebook, how significant this can be. In the early 2000s, 2010s, we began investing heavily in virtual and augmented reality. We wanted to create a headset that we dreamed of, something that was light and affordable, could run on its own without a computer or special sensors set up that you needed to do. But when we first got started, it was basically impossible. But it's not impossible anymore. You can go out right now. Where is my Oculus Quest? It's around here. Oh, so it's right here. You can buy this thing, the Oculus Quest 2, in stores right now. And it has everything you need in order to use VR. And it was advances in AI, specifically computer vision, that made this product possible. It means that there's a tiny mobile chip in here running off a very small battery, and it can process your head position and the movement of your hands in milliseconds and do all the work needed that would have required hundreds of watts of power just a few years prior. 
And that same progress allows us to add new features to this headset, like the ability to recognize your hands natively in VR, so you don't even need specialized controllers. We're seeing the same shift of capability across our products when we apply AI. And one of the most exciting and powerful parts of AI is the promise it builds to allow us to deploy new capabilities to billions of people at the same time. We automatically generate subtitles for videos at zero cost to creators. We can recognize the content of images and automatically generate spoken descriptions for the hundreds of millions of people around the world who suffer from a visual impairment. And we do 20 billion translations every day, which means that people can connect to anyone in their native language. Being able to do this at billion person scale is only possible thanks to things like AI. But what's much more exciting about this are the things that are still yet to come. As AI becomes easier and less expensive to build and deploy, the technology will proliferate rapidly. Today, the world's biggest tech companies depend on advanced AI to run the most important parts of their business. But in the coming decades, you'll see it everywhere. As we build our advancements in AI for Facebook, we release the code, pre-trained models, and the tools like PyTorch. These same tools are being used right now to impact a wide variety of industries, from farming to medicine, to autonomous vehicles, to manufacturing, and more. And just like the engine made flight possible, AI will make a number of new things possible that even I can't foresee. That's one of many reasons I'm more excited about the future than ever. But I've also learned some hard lessons in my decade in tech, and I wanted to close by sharing two of them with you today. First, the potential impact of a new technology, both good and bad, needs to be central as we build it, not after. This hasn't always been the case with a lot of new inventions, but the power and reach of new technology today demands we consider it. When I was studying to be a software engineer, I would have never imagined that 25 years later, I'd be sent to London to sit for hours of questioning by the UK Parliamentary Committee, investigating the impacts of the technology I was responsible for developing. It was a humbling and important experience for me. That investigation is just one of many as people started to grapple with questions about the impact of our technology on society. I devoted myself to building the understanding, processes, tools, and technology to make sure that we build products that are a strong net good for society. This started with focusing on the existing misuses and harms of our products and building defenses and mitigations to those harms. AI has been a transformative tool in combating misinformation, hate, bullying, radicalism, and more on our platform. In the last five years, we've seen multiple categories of violating content go from 0% of it proactively detected to 97% or higher found automatically first by our AI systems before people saw it. We've made great progress, but it isn't perfect. And we aren't done. So I'm committed to continuing that fight. But this isn't just about fixing the problems of the past. We're also fundamentally changing the way we build new products. We've learned that technologists need to anticipate the harms, misuses, and consequences of the things we're building while they're being built, not just after. That requires much closer collaboration with a diverse set of experts in fields beyond science and engineering. At Facebook, I built our responsible innovation group that now works closely with the product teams across the company to make sure all the new technologies we build are built responsibly from the beginning. That means bringing in experts in fields like equity and inclusion, sociology, anthropology, civics, and human rights to shape new technologies as they're being created. We're still learning and improving, but by building responsibly from the start, we can help ensure that new technologies improve the lives of people around the world. The second lesson I'll leave you with is that we've learned the value of scientific research. One of the best decisions we made in the last decade was putting a world-class scientific research team at the heart of our AI organization and giving that team the mandate to do the research in the open with full collaboration with academia. We made the decision early on to publish all of our research and to make sure our researchers can remain deeply involved in the academic community. And this has paid off in so many ways. Many of the world's best AI scientists have joined our research lab because they can do not just top quality scientific work, but they can also solve real world problems. And by collaborating in the open, we've benefited from an entire global research community that critiques our work and builds on it. Working so closely with academia has been a huge positive for us over the last decade, and it's something we're gonna do much more of in the coming years. And today, we're announcing that another step in that direction, we're gonna be 
bringing our PhD program to the UK in partnership with University College London, one of the, lead, one of the leading universities in AI. We're gonna host several Facebook AI research PhD students in London and give the chance to work with world leaders in AI, like John Swally Taylor, Arthur Gretton, and David Barber, covering topics like computer vision, natural language processing, and reinforcement learning. The progress being made in these fields of AI is truly stunning, and we can't wait to see the breakthroughs that come from this new partnership. Scientific research remains one of the most powerful ways to drive human progress, and I hope that is just one of many reasons why everyone here tonight will remain excited to build the future. And with that, I want to get to your questions. Mike, thank you so much for that. Um, and exactly as you said there, people can have a look at the bottom of the, the Zoom link here and there's a question and answer function. And especially, it should be a little bit of red rag to a bull mentioning this program going to be at UCL. And so hopefully Oxford can stand up and show that we can get some even better questions in. Um, but Mike, we'll, we'll start with some questions from me to start with. I suppose my first big question is, why this pessimism coming out of so many places? Because I, I consider myself very optimistic and I think that the, the, the same trends that you're talking about are going to make the world wonderful in all kinds of different ways, despite the challenges. But why is this pessimism seemingly so endemic at the moment? Well, I mean, I think I, a lot of it is founded on real concerns of, of the negative impacts of technology. And in, and in some cases, I think, you know, as I said, in my intro, we haven't really always done the homework up front to think about, you know, hey, what, what would a bad actor do with this product? How can they abuse it? How can they try to scam users? How can they do things we didn't expect? And how do we stop that from the start? Um, and the, the other challenge I'd say is the thing that's often true of new technologies and advancements is they often have very clear, acute examples where things change or are disruptive. It may be loss of jobs. It may be a new form of scam or abuse. It's something that's really easy to understand as bad. And then they have very generalized improvements in the quality of life. So if I say I've increased the GDP overall by 3%, I've made everyone slightly more prosperous, that is just harder to sort of weigh against these very acute specific harms. And so I think part of our responsibility and challenge as technologists is first of all, to really try to minimize um, or eliminate these harms from the beginning and to clearly articulate them. And also part of why I'm talking to you today to, to sort of help people understand that, you, you know, it's harder to see in the current years, but if you go back 50 years, 100 years, 300 years, and you look at how life was different then versus now, the biggest change in my mind is tech technology. 300 years ago, most of us would be subsistence farmers. Our average life expectancy would be half of what it is today. Like those changes are all as a result of prosperity empowered by technology. And so this is why I think it's important for us all to be real about the risks, but still be optimistic about the better future we can build. Thank you. And I want to get into this, this best future of all the exciting things about AI, but where, at what point was it in, in Facebook thinking, okay, well, what do, we, what do we do now to grow as a company and the products we look at and the things we can do? Why is AI become such a big focus for the company? Why not go down various other avenues? It's a great question. I mean, it's a debate we had a lot in, uh, this was in the, around the 2012, 2013 timeframe. And, you know, this was a, you know, for the first five or so years at Facebook, honestly, a lot of our focus was just trying to keep up with scaling the site. Um, there was a lot of technology and infrastructure work that had to be built to make sure that as millions or tens of millions of new people used our products, the whole thing didn't crash and burn. And that was sort of taking up all of our focus as we sort of got our arms around that and sort of moved that into a longer term technological roadmap. It opened up the space to think not just about today and tomorrow, but about the next year or 10 years. And as we looked at that, we saw that um, this was a period of time when AI was just making a breakthrough. There's a, a really seminal breakthrough in computer vision where Alexa net, this, this, this convolutional neural net, this deep network um, sort of won one of the computer vision challenges and handedly built, beat everything prior to it. Um, and this was a real moment, I think, for a lot of people to say, huh, maybe actually some of these decades old ideas in AI can now work given data and compute advances. And so we started experimenting with how they could work in our products and what we could do with them. And then we realized we didn't wanna be reading other people's research papers and trying to re-implement them. We wanted to be pushing this, the frontier in the state of the art. 
we looked at a lot of technological areas and made a very explicit choice to build a research lab focused exclusively on AI rather than a generalized research center, because we just felt like if we put all of our energy there, there's so much that AI could do, you know, to Facebook and, and to the world. And, and I think it's actually turned out better than, than I'd hoped both for the industry and, and for us in terms of the rap rapidity of advances from, you know, say 2013 to now. Super. And I just wondered, before, and as we go into some of these things, what are the some, some, for maybe some of the people who are watching who aren't steeped in some of this stuff, what are the kind of, when someone uses one of the Facebook products, how and when are they interacting with some artificial intelligence? And what are the kind of tangible real world examples of this that they'll be feeling? That's a great, that's a good question. I mean, if you, if you uh, ever use a VR product like the Oculus Quest, this thing is just like, doesn't work without computer vision. It's, it's the way we figure out how to recreate where you are in, in the physical world and virtual reality. If you use the Facebook portal, which is a video chat device, it also is powered by AI that sort of automatically pans and zooms the camera. So you don't have to you know, chase your kids around the room with a tablet if you're talking with grandma, which is personal experience here. Um, and, uh, you know, and then on the Facebook products itself, if you've ever had a comment translated, um, and so you saw a translation happening, if you ever, um, had a, um, uh, looked at a video and had, were on mute and got captions for a live broadcast. That stuff is all happening, you know, with, with, with AI. And of course, uh, you know, I talked about this in, in, in the lead up, but um, it has been one of the best tools at our disposal to stop violating content for showing up on Facebook. And that, you know, started with things like spam, but has moved into misinformation and hate speech and other things like that. And the power of AI for those sorts of things is prior to, I mean, if you, if you go back eight years ago, the dominant way we'd find a lot of this stuff is one of you saw it and you clicked on a little button and you reported it to us and said, hey, this doesn't look like it belongs on Facebook. Well, that's problematic for a whole number of reasons. Among other things, like you've already seen it. The damage has already been done. Now another human has to look at this, this junk and then decide whether it's, it's there or not. So you, you're exposing multiple people to possibly, you know, at best spammy content and worst horrific content. Um, and when you have an AI system do this, we catch it before anyone's seen it and we can save a whole lot of people from being exposed to that. So that, you know, that has been a, a huge transformation in, in how we manage that while still letting everyone in the world have a text box that they can type anything they want, upload any photo or video live stream whenever they want. So not adding friction for, for the ability of people to communicate with, with who they want to communicate with. I can I can definitely see then that if if there's a um, a preponderance of of bad content that gets put up on there, it's much quicker and you say quicker being good so people don't see it and more efficient um, in terms of getting content off. What are some of the the moral uh, hazards potentially of letting that be done by a computer rather than a sort of huge team of people? Do things slip through the net, or, or what? The, what are the kind of moral questions that you, as, as I guess technicians and designers, go through in trying to, to think through passing some of these problems off to computers? It's a great question, and, and I think you first have to start with realizing that these are human problems, and humans need to be at the sort of decision loop. You know, what is hate speech versus not is a is a very fundamentally human question that very smart experts you know, will debate on the nuances and the edges of those policies. And so I think that I'm under no sort of illusion that at the end of the day, how these policies are built, where the edge cases are, is something that we need large teams of experts to weigh in on and humans to be overseeing at the end. So, so this is not replacing people with AI, it's, it's simply augmenting them. You know, I like to think of this, you know, if you wanted to dig a hole in your backyard and I gave you a shovel versus I drove a backhoe over there. You're gonna dig it in an afternoon with a backhoe and several weeks with a shovel. Like, and, and what I'm trying to do is provide sort of power tools to the humans who need to make the decision and then say, you know what? I think this is misinformation, please put a label on it. And then when you, what you get is a whole bunch of variants of that thing. Maybe the image changes a little bit, the words change around a little bit, but it's fundamentally the same thing. Instead of that person then having to go find every small, tiny little variant of this thing, we have systems that can say, hey, all of these things look like they're the same. We will. Um, you know, apply our policies towards it in, in that way. And that's sort of the, the power tools angle. Now, like any powerful tool, you have to understand where there are mistakes or where these things go wrong. Every system, including humans, have error rates. Um, you know, you have false positives where you mistakenly identify something as violating or false negatives where you take something down um, uh, when you shouldn't. Um, so, these are things that happen in, in automated systems. There, there are things that happen in, in human review. 
So you have to have strong oversight on these things and make sure you have ways to review, to audit, to check. And particularly with things that take broad sweeping, you know, application of these to make sure they're not disproportionately impacting certain communities. So, you know, are they affecting people in, in certain areas, certain zip codes, certain age ranges, whatever it may be. And that's where a lot of the, what I talk about responsible innovation, responsible AI is, is sort of vetting and testing. There isn't some unintended consequence from this, this automated system. And that's the work you just have to do sort of every day. So it's not a, it's not a panacea, but it is a really important tool in our arsenal if, if sort of applied well. Thank you. you. You mentioned unintended consequences. I've always wanted to ask some of these questions to people really in the know. When I, I grew up with watching sci-fi with my with my old man and sort of the come some of the Philip K. Dick and Isaac Asimov and some of the, you know, iRobot, the three I laws of robotics and all these sorts of things. And, and lots of them tend to go down these kind of horrifying dystopian um, futures where the, the programs are set that mean very well. And it ends up, as you say, having these kind of unintended consequences. So the, this question is going to be a bit of a of a flight of fancy one. But where do you stand on the these arguments that so you some people like Elon Musk who have a very particular stance on how and where AI is going and people are a lot more positive or negative so if you know letting not your imagination run wild exactly but those kinds of sort of semi dystopian ideas where can and might in a, in a worst case scenario some of this technology take us as a society I mean I'm, I'm a voracious lover reader watcher of sci-fi you know everything from you know Asimov I, I read as a kid and and was fascinated with and and you know on TV in recent years, Black Mirror is obviously a brilliant sort of depiction of both some of the amazing and, and very scary things that can happen with technology. Um, when, you, when it comes to AI specifically, I, I am in a very particular spot here, which is I think that there are, um, there are narrow AIs and there are generalized AIs. What I mean by narrow AI is you know, we've built a system that helps to read MRIs for knee MRIs faster so you require 4X less time in the MRI machine. That system can't play video games. It can't manage content on Facebook. It can look at knee MRIs. And generalizability and transfer learning is an unsolved problem in AI research in general. So how do I take something and generalize it from one to another? We're making interesting progress in a bunch of areas, but we're quite a ways away from a, from a generalized intelligence. And I think this is what the... The, the sort of the worst of the worst sort of fears of AI is, is this generalized intelligence. Um, and I think this is one of the reasons I'm such a big proponent of open research in AI, because I think when you don't know what's happening is when you don't have choices on these things. But when you're doing this in the open, people are publishing, they're vetting work, they're open sourcing code. You don't have to trust me. You can kind of look at a whole bunch of experts who can look at the data and say, actually, no, Shrep's wrong. There's, there's these issues in these emerging systems. And that, that's exactly the process I want. That's like um, collaborative and, and, and peer-reviewed science at its best. Um, so that's one angle. The other angle that I think is a real issue is even in narrow AIs. So when you have AIs making critical decisions, it's really important that you cross-check how those things are working. I'm talking about you know, people have tried to do things like parole recommendations or sen sentencing rec recommendations in the criminal justice system. If you're going to be making healthcare decisions for people, those are life changing life or death decisions. And so you better be darn sure that your system is calibrated across everything you're, you're interested about, doesn't have some unanticipated, unanticipated racial bias, um, isn't picking up some skew in data on how policing is done and using that as the factor. Like those are things where you need to measure 16 times and cut once before you deploy a system because they have such important consequences on real people. And so those are real concerns and, and are things that, that we deal with. And, and even in our own systems, I mentioned we have a separate subteam called Responsible AI who's helping us understand as we deploy AI systems, what are possible you know, concerns, unintended consequences, how do we measure them, mitigate them and understand it up front. And I think that that's that's a part of how we can address some of the near-term concerns about this. Okay, thank you. That, that puts some of my concerns about a kind of terrifying robotic future of, of AI controlling us to rest slightly. But but that uh, generalizable AI going off into the future, and you know, so a, a question I wanted to ask was something a bit banal of you know where do you see this technology in ten years, in twenty five years, in fifty years? When we look at what the world will look like in what 2070 something, what how much will AI have changed the world there? How will it affect it? And will we be close to this sort of 
generalizable AI potentially? I know it's asking you to speculate something a long yeah. time. Yeah. No, I mean it's such a hard question because you know part of my belief system is that that it's really hard to predict how these things end up manifesting. If you you know go back in time and look at people's predictions of the future, they're usually off by a lot um, because it's it's really hard to imagine. If you know if you went back in the 1990s and tried to describe Uber or you know any of the number of the smartphone enabled services, it it would have seemed sort of um, interesting and, and, and out there even then, you know, a few decades earlier. Um, and we often map the future based on what we understand of the present, which is why it's really hard to predict um, these things. But, but I, I'm guessing there are a few things that are going to happen. Um, I mean, if you sort of go way back in time and you look at, I mean, if you go back 400 years, you know, the Industrial Revolution was really, it's, it's just amazing to think about. You know, in the 1600s, if I wanted to physically move something, I had to use muscle power animal or human. If I wanted to like pump water out of a coal mine or ship something, it was like an animal or human operating a pump. And the, the primary first application of steam engines was mechanical things. It was pumping out wells and doing things like that. And then we obviously applied it to transport. And then there was a second wave where you went from these sort of massive machines that were built on site to distribution, which is what electrification did. It said, I can have a power plant hundreds of miles away and then have a coffee grinder in my home or a blender that I can turn on and use energy to make mechanical stuff happen without even worrying about where the heck these electrons came from. I mean, that's just, just sort of to someone in the 1700s would have, again, been fantastical. I think what we're going through with computing right now is computing first was targeted at very clearly specified, you know, the early computers were like solving linear equations. And instead of humans tabulating these big tables of, of trajectories of projectiles in World War II, they were trying to automate this with, with computers. Um, and that's, you know, the last 70 years has been, let's automate things that are um, easy to automate. Um, I, you don't have an elevator operator more you, on, a, on, a, on a plane, you know, manually balance the, the sort of the fuel tanks, the computer does it for you. These are well understood problems. Where AI is going, is AI is moving us from these sort of easy to understand things to places where people are doing analysis and decisions. I'm looking at this MRI and trying to decide whether surgery is the right thing or not. Um, looking at this x-ray and trying to diagnose sort of what's happening here. You know, these are the sorts of things that will apply. And the, the interesting thing about that is when done well, it again, democratizes access to these. So rather than having 10 experts in the world who are great at this, we can build a smartphone app that everyone in the world is, is going to have effectively the world's best radiologist at their disposal 24 um, seven. And I think there's going to be a whole suite of things that are sort of specialist specialized technologies today that will be commonplace in, in, in everyone's world. And the last thing I'll say is there's any number of places where we're running very suboptimal systems. How often do I water my plants on my farm? How close do I put my plants together? When do I harvest them? I mean, sometimes you like look at the almanac, sometimes you guess how you did it. When you have sensors, when you have computer vision telling you how much water is in the soil, you can dramatically improve yields, you can reduce water use, you can improve land use. So this will be an opportunity for us to optimize a whole ton of important systems across the humanity to sort of help support the, the growing planet. Thank you. Some, some of these things uh, I think could be, be touched upon. You talk about um, the various yields and real world applications. Some people have used this, what I, I fear may be a slight buzzword of talking about the fourth industrial revolution. And then people start throwing around things like big data and machine learning and all these sorts of things. I'm not a real scientist. I've got a master's in social science, which is about as far from, I suspect, hard science as, as anyone else watching would like to believe. When people start throwing those buzzwords around, do you think that means that people don't know what they're talking about? Do you think it would all just come under the, the kind of auspices of AI? Or, you know, to somebody watching who doesn't know about machine learning and big data and all these sorts of things, are you basically just describing real world versions or examples of that? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not too much into labeling these things. I, I do think, you know, if, if you know, and I think there's a mystique that people apply to technology, and I think it's one of the big, um, big problems I want to break down. Because you know, I haven't met a person who can't learn this stuff if they put their mind to it, um, and it is not uh, a thing that only elite technologists should understand. I think the basics of AI machine learning can be taught to most people, and and you know, in the current incarnation, a lot of these things is you know, what do people do every day? We make decisions on, on things like, do I stop at the stoplight? Is it safe for me to turn left? I mean, let's, let's take a really easy autonomous vehicles that people understand. Just think about driving your car and all the decisions you make. You take sensor data in from your eyes and your ears and you make motor control. You move your hands to move, steer the wheel and, and hit the pedals. 
to make sure. And it's, you know, and, and it's a surprisingly varied experience. If you talk to the people building autonomous cars, they'll say the reason they aren't widely deployed on the market is it's easy to do when it's sunny and there's not a lot of traffic. But if we didn't train for, you know, a logging truck going the other way, breaking straps and logs literally rolling across the front of the highway, you know, and so your car sees logs rolling in front of it for the very first time when you're going 70 miles an hour, you know, that's a really hard thing to guess for until you're driving around and you're saying like, wait a second, the car didn't understand what that was. What was it? Holy cow, logs are rolling across the highway. That is not something I would have thought of in the lab, you know. So this is the real world. It's complicated and it's messy. And humans are amazing at adapting to complicated, messy things and generalizing. Um, and what we're doing is we're building machines that are better and better at doing this as well. And so they will, in, in more cases, be able to do this and help us make these decisions. So give us a warning that we didn't see there was a person who just stepped out in the road, um, you know, or the car stopped more suddenly in front of us. And so we should stop our vehicle. So I think thinking of it as computers that are getting better like humans to sort of take data in and make decisions and analysis and where that can apply all across the world from medicine to, to, to you know, again, farming, to transportation, to others, and allow us to sort of optimize a lot of systems in the world towards, towards a you know, better, more prosperous life for people. Thank you. I, I love that point about the, 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 the mystique that builds up around some of these things. Is it Arthur C. Clarke, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic for some people? Um, and, you, and you mentioned on the, this point about logs and things like that. There'll be a lot of people watching this with uh, who are studying philosophy at the moment, and it'll be heartening for them to think that um, things, studying things like the trolley problem may actually come and have some real world applications at some point. But whilst you may be creating some jobs for some sort of budding philosophers watching, the big concern about automation that you mentioned in your previous answer, but one, is the fear that it will take lots of jobs away. Uh, and I, in a past life, I've done a bit of work on this. And Aristotle, I think, and Elizabeth I, even, there's a quote of her fearing that automation may take jobs away. And it's never been the case so far. It's always made more jobs. But when you get sufficiently advanced with some of these technologies, are we all not just going to be out of a job in 50 years unless we are looking after children or cooking something, maybe even that will go, or being app designers? I don't think so. I mean, as you say, if you, if you look at this over millennia of technological advancement, when it happens, what, what you see is a change in the jobs. So it certainly wouldn't be good to be a stenographer these days and have to rewrite books by hand like that. That was a job that sort of went out with the printing press, um, you, you know, being in a, a, many, many other jobs have sort of been replaced over the millennia or changed. And so that's a real disruption that we need to acknowledge that that the nature of jobs will be changing and will be changing dramatically. And that's something for us to grapple with as a society. And I think a real place for, for government and other organizations to help with support, retraining, et cetera, you know, as things happen, as things change. So, so we need to acknowledge that and not pretend like that's not a real thing. Um, however, as you say, new jobs open up. You know, the idea of a computer programmer, you know, many students are watching this now. If we were in the 1930s, there wasn't even the concept of a computer programmer, right? You had to go to, to Grace Hopper to actually, you know, she was the one who sort of really pioneered the, the, the job of computer programming. And in fact, the reason why many women were the pioneers in computer programming is because the men didn't think it was that important in the beginning. They thought building the machine was the important bit. And then it turns out women made a lot of the seminal advances in computing in the, in the early years. Um, uh, you know, Grace Hopper and others, um, you know, the six women who sort of helped to program the ENIAC. Um, so the, 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 the nature of things change. I think it'll open up new opportunities. It opens up more time for arts, for leisure, for advanced roles. The other thing you see is specialization. You know, the idea that thousands or tens of thousands of people can go get PhDs and advanced degrees in area, that's enabled because they don't have to spend their day not just farming, but creating light. I mean, if you go back in the 1800s, people would spend time making candles so that they could read at night. Even you know, professors at major and, and deans and chancellors at major universities, you can see in their journals about how they spent the week making tallow candles so they could read books at night. Like now we just flick on a light switch. And so every time these technological advancements happen, they sort of open up the space for us to apply our brains to, to bigger, higher order problems. And I don't see why that's necessarily gonna change in the next 50 years if it hasn't in the last several millennia. That's, that's really interesting. Thank you. And, and, and this, we're going, this last question from, on this point uh, about concerns into the future goes a little bit beyond Facebook, but, but things like military concerns around artificial intelligence, and you go, it's a similar kind of set of sort of trolley problems of driverless cars and things like that. 
it, when you think about designing some of these things in an artificial intelligence broadly in things like combat or, or sort of at states using these things, let's say more broadly states using some of these technologies, what are the kind of concerns there? We've talked about the great opportunities, but what's the one thing that would give you pause for thought and make you think that perhaps this uh, genie may, needs to be put back in the lamp? Well, I, I would say a few things. You know, the first is, as I said, when I talked about our own systems that I think fundamentally it's important that humans sort of be in the ultimate control and loop of these things. Cause these are, you know, the more serious the, the repercussions is of these decisions, the more oversight it requires um, because these are serious decisions that need to be made with the right sort of oversight. So I think ever forgetting that or losing that is a, is a, is a huge um, problem as these systems go. The other thing is I think there are multi-use technologies and there are technologies that have more inherent risks. Um, you know, as an example, we have done a lot of work in natural language processing. And a lot of our work in natural language processing is boiled down to machine translation. So how do we um, translate from one language to another? Um, and in content understanding, how do I better understand you know, what this content is saying and what topics it may be about? Because those things, as far as I can tell, have really, really good applications. There's another burgeoning field of NLP, which is content generation. Can I build an AI that can sort of spew out new, new texts and posts? Now, that may be helpful as a writing assistant, but I also think it is dangerous in terms of its applications to misinformation um, and, uh, and spam and FUD and other things like that. So that's an area we chose to not invest very heavily in because we are concerned about its sort of good versus bad balance versus other technologies we may have invested in. So I think there are places where you need to make conscious choices about the sort of balance of impact of these technologies. But, but ultimately, I think it's, it's about sort of understanding the human oversight and the, the impact, both good and bad, of, of these things, sort of as you're building them, not just once they're once they're unleashed. Thank you. I mean, I've, I've asked you, that's a very uh, mean question in some ways. So it, a, a bit of a softball one. What, what is the most annoying thing in your life at the moment or in someone's life that in 10 years time will not be an issue? Um, so, you know, the, the kind of thing you're most excited about, give us a, just a short answer on and some of the yeah. things coming. And, and look, for, for the people asking the questions, like I want to hear what's on your mind. Don't 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 softball it to me. Like this is this is a chance to get real with these issues. That's what we're here for. Um uh, but I think, I mean, the, the thing that annoys me right now is that I'm staring at a 2D screen of you. And this is a poor facsimile of seeing you in person. And I think this is something that everyone can relate. Um, I imagine in 10 years we will have. Um, virtual humans and virtual reality experiences that will be so much closer to reality that even when people can travel, they will decide not to because it's just good enough to sort of interact with someone in 3D across space without having to get on an airplane or drive in a car. And so we're going to sort of, you know, teleport rather than, than transport, um, you know, people to these, to these different, demand, demand, different uh, locations. So that's that's the thing I think will be different is sort of our ability to connect with people across distance. And I'm sure in 10 years, it'll be fundamentally different than it is right now. Excellent. Thank you. Well, uh, as you mentioned, well, I'm going to get onto the dozens of incredible questions in just a second. There's, there's one question that I've been asking everybody this term and, and maybe we've already, you've just touched on it exactly there. And the question normally is what is the one thing we should be either worried about or excited about, but that nobody's talking about. And of course, lots of people are talking about some of these technologies. So maybe there's something else that we're not talking about that you think would be very exciting. We had Steven Pinker mention new generation, small scale nuclear reactors, which I thought was probably my favorite answer of the term so far. Well, there's a lot of stuff. I mean, you know, you've heard me talk a lot about VR. Um, you know, I think we have been investing in VR for the last seven or eight years now. And I think for a long time, people sort of wrote it off as, you know, something that's been tried multiple decades and never arrived. You know, now we're seeing, um, you know, people making real money building VR experiences and, and average people every day sort of buying and using these headsets. And so I think, you know, to me, the exciting part of technology is not when it's first created, it's when it gets in the hands of lots of people, because that's when it really starts to impact the world. And, you know, VR is really in that beginning of that S-curve. So I think, you know, hang on and wait. A lot of people were excited about AR and I'm excited about, you know, the idea of glasses that have sort of superpowers. I'm excited about that too. The technology for that is, you know, five or 10 years out to do that really well. Um, and it's, and it's definitely in the labs, the technology to build VR is here today and we, we have products on market. So that's, that's, I think really exciting. And, and you mentioned, you know, sort of um, compact nuclear reactors. I mean, I think we're in the, 
in the beginnings of a really exciting transformation of the entire sector of energy, um, you know, from fossil fuel based to um, to other technologies that will do it, you know, wind, solar, um, the electrification um, of, of absolutely everything. And I think AI has a big part to play in this because there's a lot of places where we're running really inefficient systems because we don't measure them well and we can optimize them a lot better and, and save a lot of energy along the way. So there's a there's a lot to do. Thank you. That, that just made me think of one one bonus question. I promise I will um, open it up to our members in a second. But you talk, I talk about energy there and, and the kind of opportunities for efficiencies and things like that. Does that make you then less concerned about something like climate change? Which everybody normally people have given climate change as their answer, the thing we should be worried about. But being this kind of optimist, knowing the kind of the potential of future technologies, is it possible that you're maybe more sanguine about it? I'm, I'm certainly more sanguine about the future of these things because I believe we'll be able to innovate things out. I'm not at all sanguine. I am deeply worried about climate change, just to just to be um, real. Um, I'm spending a bunch of my time sort of trying to figure out um, how how to help accelerate some of the things. I think it is a tractable problem if we put our head to it. But I think one of the challenges is, again, it's this sort of it's the reverse of the technological innovation. It's a it's a slow boil problem that isn't totally obvious until it's a little too late. And those things are typically very hard to sort of rally people to get excited about. She's like, ah, oh, well, we'll kind of deal with it next year. And then, you know, any engineer understands sort of cascade systems or, or exponential growth on these things is you have these compound effects and, and the permafrost starts to melt and that releases a lot more carbon and it's a feedback cycle. And it makes it much harder to deal with 20 years from now than, than 10 years from now and now. The other thing about climate change is I think it is often um, mischaracterized as, you know, what we need to do is cut back. It's prosperity versus climate. And I think that's wrong. Part of why I'm so excited about technology is I think when we apply our brains to it, technology means prosperity and climate, right? When we have battery powered cars, when I can communicate with you in VR and not get on an airplane, like that is going to be a dramatic reduction in carbon footprint and a much better experience because I get to spend that day with my family instead of flying in an airplane all day. And so I think that technology is the yes and solution. It allows us to remove constraints and say, nope, I want every one of the you know eight, nine, 10 billion people on this planet to live a life of health and prosperity and to have our planet be suitable for my children and their grandchildren to live in prosperity. Those can be accomplished if we sort of get off the couch and start doing the work to deploy these things out in the real world. Thank you very much. I'm going to turn now to uh, to the questions from the audience, and I think maybe a good a good first one. We've got one here from uh, from Manuel Fieber at St Hughes College, um, who says, "Thank you for your insights, Mike, especially around things like AI and your research." And his question is, it's not about tech, but it's about your career as a leader. He says, "What are the biggest challenges you face, and how did you overcome them?" And I wonder if I could broaden that out as well into uh, advice for people who are watching, who are studying either undergraduate degrees or postgraduate degrees, and their thinking about what their career can and should and would look like? Yeah. Um, well, I, um, I mean, there's a, there's a lot there. I, I, you know, the best advice I can give to people is to never get tired of learning um, because the world changes so much. When I went to school, artificial intelligence was like tree pruning and alpha beta search. And I thought it was boring because it wasn't doing anything interesting. So I studied systems and graphics instead. You know, so I, I didn't come at our current work as an AI expert from the 1990s, and none of that stuff was really relevant because the field is very different now. And so I've had to learn a lot of this along the way. So I think in my first best advice is, is, to, is to always be willing to learn. Um, I'd say my best tool at the job is to say, I don't understand that. Can you help explain it to me? And that sounds like a really simple thing, but I can't tell you how many people you know, get into a career, get into a job, they have a director title or VP title or fancy title like mine, and they go, oh gosh, I should really know the answer to this question. I'm gonna look like a dummy if I ask. And that's a real thing and your ego gets in your way. But I have yet to encounter a time when I ask an engineer a question that maybe I should have known the answer to, like, hey, I don't understand how this works. Can you explain it to me? And those are the best conversations I've ever had. That's the best part of my job is here's someone here, teach, I'm getting paid to learn. Like, how great is that? Often from the world expert in it. Like shame on me if I don't take advantage of that every moment of the day and then take those learnings and figure out how to give them to other people and apply them to things that matter. So don't let your ego get in the way. The last thing I'd say is, you know, surround yourself with people you admire. Like you will become the peer set you work with. So find people that are smarter than you, better than you, that are good people that you want 
values to have. I mean, one of the things I teach my children all the time is, is you know, the friends and colleagues you choose um, is, is this privilege we get. And I only like to be with people that I admire and, and I want to be more like um, because I learn things from them every day and they inspire me. And that, that is a thing that I think is people often mistake when they think about where to work or what to work on is the people. Thank you very much. We've got a, a question from uh, from Paula Schindler at Brazenose College, who is asking about the the role that you'll have in designing products that, and the effect they will have on things like freedom of speech and things like elections. And so when you're designing products, um, how does freedom of speech play in, in the kind of difficult balance that you've got to strike on these things on your on your platforms? Yeah, I mean, this is honestly one of the toughest things we, we face because there, there is, you know, there, there are places in life where there are conflicting goals and there's conflicting interests and you're find, trying to find sort of a perfect balance between them. I'd say we approach this always starting from the point of view that sort of lowering friction to communication, uh, e.g., you know, a decade or two ago, it would have cost 10 cents every time I wanted to send someone a message on my mobile phone. I mean, to most people listening to this, they must think that that's just, just, bananas, right? The idea that you have to like meter out your messages because you're worried about how much each message is going to cost, right? And getting that cost to zero to free is, is a net good for society. That means I can send a message to anyone in the world. I can video call with anyone. Like, I think that that, that is clearly going to be a, a net good. So I think we start with trying to reduce friction. You realize, however, though, when, when you reduce friction, it's not, not 100% all good. There are bad things that happen. Misinformation can spread um, polarization, radicalization can, can spread, other things like that. So I think we started like, how do we reduce the friction? And then what are all the bad sort of applications impact misuse of these? How do we categorize them? And sort of how do we contain them and reduce them without limiting freedom of speech? Because certainly, you know, as a thought experiment, you know, if, if you pre-reviewed everything you posted ever on the internet, so you, you, you type in your status update and you get a message that says one of our trained analysts will review this to make sure it's appropriate before we post it. Will that change your behavior? Absolutely, right? Will it stop you from sending messages to people? Absolutely. So you know that sort of level of friction would, would eliminate these problems or, or reduce them, but at a grave cost. And so we're trying to figure out how do we make it easy for people to share because most, you know, 99 out of 100 of those cases are good and then build the tools, both human and automated, to sort of reduce the bad effects so that people can still have the opportunity to share. That's the, that's the way we approach it. Thank you. I, I definitely think that uh, if there were that kind of content moderation, that some of the dad jokes that I put on Facebook would never make it on. Um, there's some great questions coming in here. One is from uh, Louis de Rocha Ferreira, who's asking about deep fake detection. Um, how serious can it be as a problem and, and what can we do about it? I mean, this is a really good example of something I was really worried about that hadn't yet turned out to be a big problem. So, you know, almost two years ago now, um, we kicked off a thing called the Deep Fake Detection Challenge because at the time we didn't have. So, for those who don't know, Deep Fake is a is a you know sort of AI doctored video where you can, for example, make make it look like someone's doing something they're not. Um, and I was you know gravely worried about this as a tool for for misinformation. Um, and at the time, there weren't any classifiers, there weren't any tools I had that could tell me whether this video was a deep pick or not at anywhere near the accuracy needed to work in our scale and in our production. So we um, kicked off a public challenge called the deep pick detection challenge, where we basically challenged the industry, which had built a data set of deep picks. So we went out and filmed a bunch of actors with clear consent and said, this video is going to be used to generate deep picks and then generate a you know, academic challenge. We want to make sure you understand that before we record, which actually was a whole lot of work, got all that together. Um, got the data set out, and it has resulted in a whole bunch of open source deep fake detectors uh, that we've now based some of our work in advance from there. So we have detectors in production that, that can identify um, deep fake videos. Um, it hasn't been a huge use for misinformation. It is worth saying that one of the most awful applications and common applications of deep fakes um, is, is, is against women. Um, it's often sort of revenge, um, pornography, other things like that. Um, that are used to shame or harm women. And that's a, that's a terrible, terrible thing as well um, and something we, we wanna combat. So I, I think it's um, from a misinformation standpoint hasn't turned out to be what we want, but it's one of the many places that I wanted to build the technological defense sort of before the problem was, was paramount because these things take a long time to build. And one of the many examples of things where we're trying to think in advance of like, well, what could the issues be? If that is an issue, what tools do I need? How long are they gonna take to build? If the answer is years, then we need to get started right now is sort of how we approach these things in general. 
Thank you. There's a, I just think this coming up is a, it's just a great question from uh, uh, from Yulia Savikovskaya, who asks about the development of AI. Will it diminish emotional intelligence and empathy of youngsters with reading novels and watching plays being less useful than spending time uh, on technology? She says, uh, are Proust and Tolstoy going to become irrelevant? That's a great question. I mean, my my ultimate hope, and, and we're in this odd place where, um, you, you know, I think that in some ways, technology is connecting us more than ever, and in other ways, technology is pulling us out of the moment. Um, so, you know, every one of you have been in, in, an, in an important moment with someone you care about, and the phone comes out, right? And they have, they have sort of the zombie stare at their phone <laughs> as they're looking at it and completely ignoring you. I've locked um, mine away. <laughs> and, and that's terrible, right? It's, it's, you know, the gold standard for sort of happiness in life is, is, is being with real people in the real world. Um, and technology should be an enabler, not a distractor for that. And I think we're at sort of, honestly think we're at sort of a local minimum on this right now. And what I think is going to happen over time, um, and this is, I think, the real promise of AR glasses, is to sort of give me the connectivity that no one wants to get rid of. Like, you still want to know if there's a critical message or something going on, but I don't want to be, you know, pulling this rectangle out of my pocket to stare at it. I just, I want to be focused on you. I want to be focused on my kids. Um, I want to be able to take pictures of, you know, the moment we're having and share them. I want to get key messages, but I don't want to be fumbling with devices. And I do think sort of this ambient computing that is with me all the time will sort of reswing this pendulum back towards actually just giving me more time to be with people and getting sort of the technology out of the way um, where it is today. Thank you. There's a, another great question coming up here. And I think, uh, especially bearing in mind that you've been with Facebook for, for quite a while now, um, it's Jacob Murphy at Magdalen College. He says, how do you think about maintaining Facebook's innovation and agility and speed as the company becomes much bigger and has more stakeholders to consider and is based all around the world? This is a great question. I mean, this is honestly, I, I know there was a question in the Q&A about like, what's my day job like? Yeah. This is a lot of what my day job is, is trying to ensure, like, you know, we've got thousands, tens of thousands of brilliant engineers. Every one of them is an expert in a field more than I am. So my job is to sort of create the conditions for them to do their best work, not to tell them how, you know, what to do or how to do it. Um, and something I focus on sort of every single day, you know, I think you, you've got to have great people who are excited to, to build new things. And you've got to create that environment where, where it's possible to do so. So for example, in the AI research lab, one of the challenges of research is getting people to focus long-term. You know, it's really easy to focus on something that is a deliverable this quarter or next quarter or this half or next half and getting people to focus on things that may not pay off now, but if I work on it will be a big deal over the next three years is, is, a, is a lot of work and a, and a lot of effort to make sure it's right. And also just that people don't lose the why, the inspiration, right? This is a lot of what I'm talking about today is, is just, uh, you know, the reason I'm still in tech 25 years later is... I still think it is the best way to improve the human condition. And I think we can't lose that thought despite all the challenges we have. And, and when we're inspired to do that, we can do a lot of great things. And so just getting people fired up to do it and to go tackle it, I think is a, is a lot of the challenge. I think a perfect follow-up to this, a question here from Rick Collins, who says, what do you think we can do, even those of us who aren't involved in tech and research to help progress towards this, this kind of exciting future that you put out? If people aren't naturally tech heads, is it worth spending a long time relearning how to code and things like that? Or what can, what can sort of novices do? I mean, I think, look, the, the, the future is going to require all people of all backgrounds, disciplines, and interests to, to help build it together. So, uh, you know, I think one of the most frustrating things ever, and we mentioned this before, is when, when technologists use jargon and talk down to people and pretend like this isn't a thing that everyone can understand. So even if you're not formally educated in computer science, even if you're not in a technical degree, like you can learn whatever you want to learn. There's great courses online. There's great books. Um, there's, there's great ways to do it. And, and you can you know, become uh, proficient in, in anything you want. And I think figuring out what's interesting to you and how you want to contribute. If you, if you come from a philosophy background, we can probably use your expertise as we think through a lot of these hard challenges and the trade-off of technology and applying your philosophy background and getting some understanding of how the technology works would be an awesome thing. You know, if you're an economist, like we've got a lot of work we need to do in, in modeling out sort of the impact of different technologies and different sectors of the economy and how, how do we as a government and society sort of make this good for everyone. There is so much that needs to be done. And I think if, you know, honestly, if, if, if everyone sort of zoned out this whole talk and got bored with me and then woke up and heard me say, be excited about the future, get up off the couch and lean in and, and help us make it great. Like there is a place for all of you. 
Okay, thank you very much. So I'm afraid we're rapidly running out of time. I'll try and get through a couple more here. There's a, a very easy, soft one here where an, uh, an anonymous attendee says, what's your view towards quantum computing, especially in the areas of things like cryptography and, and simulation? So maybe you could just explain very briefly qu quantum computing and how that could be used for some of these exciting things. An easy question for you, Mike. Quickly explain. Well, let me start with quantum mechanics. Um, the, you know, you, uh, it, it's difficult to explain quantum computing quickly, quickly, but it is a very different way of doing computation that doesn't use the sort of binary on-off basics that um, have, have sort of um, been fundamental to digital computers since the 1940s. Um, and it, it uses the idea of quantum states so you can sort of be in, in multiple positions at once in order to do computation. Um, my view is it's a long-term bet. Um, I, you know, I think it is interesting. Um, I think it will have particular applic applicability in certain regions like uh, that are naturally attuned to um, quantum problems, things like material science, for example, possibly biological simulation. Um, but, you know, we're still a ways out from, from sort of long-term or, or everyday applications of this. So I think it's an exciting field. I think, you know, I'm, I'm curious to see where it goes in the, in the next 10 years. Thank you. There's a, uh, maybe one, uh, one or two more questions here. One from Liberty Hunter, who says, who's, basically her question is asking about uh, regulation of the new technologies that you're coming out with yourselves. Uh, is it, does Facebook think a lot about self-regulation or how it can interact with other kind of regulatory bodies, especially with, as you say, something like deep fakes that aren't really a problem yet, but may become one in the future? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, what do we want in society? We want transparency. Uh, we want oversight and accountability clarity on what the rules are. And I think one of the challenges of new technologies is, is they sort of move ahead of sort of societal understanding and laws and regulations on sort of what the, what the rules of the game are. So we're definitely in a period where um, we're going to see increasing regulation and laws um, and norms sort of evolve. You know, a lot of what we talked about content standards, you know, most of the stuff we take down on, on Facebook is a violation of a standard that, that we made, but isn't a law. Um, and over time, we want sort of society to really be making those decisions. We, we, we've done two things. One is we, we do this quarterly report on what we take down and why called the Community Enforcement Standards Report. The other thing we're trying to do is get external oversight. So you may have seen recently that the Facebook Oversight Board basically overruled us on a series of content decisions. And these are binding decisions from a neutral third party that is not, you know, we, we basically put an endowment in, but otherwise don't control or can't control. And we have to abide by their decisions. And part of their feedback was we need clear rules and guidelines and how these things work. And, and, and you know, my hope is over time, we can sort of figure these things out, whether that's through third parties, whether that's through regulation, the end result is sort of clear, transparent rules and oversight that people sort of all are like, yeah, okay, that seems reasonable. Um, that's a reasonable place to land on the sort of freedom of expression versus dangers, you know, sort of spectrum. Mike, thank you so much. I'm afraid we're almost out of time. I'm just going to take one very quick one. Someone says, what's the biggest call you've made in your role as CTO? But I'll maybe expand that out. What's the sort of, what's the best day you've had on the job or what's the coolest thing you've, you've done or experienced or seen? Um, I mean, I'll, I'll answer that in a couple of different ways. I think, you know, there are a few moments when, you, you know, I got to see something years before it was in broad use. And so I think VR, you know, I first saw VR in 2013, 2014, and it was just, you could sort of imagine how it was all going to come together to where we are today. Um, it happened actually faster than I thought, but, but it didn't, uh, it, it was really fun to see. Um, I, I'd say that the other, um, you know, building the AI research lab, I think, you know, right now looks like well-timed and prescient, um, but I think we were lucky in a, in a lot of ways. I think, you know, trying to get AI to help us with content moderation was an incredibly controversial decision, you know, from the very beginning, everything from would it actually work to was this the right approach? Um, and we just decided to sort of muscle through and, and, and apply it. And, you know, it's the credit to the team. You know, you know, I'd say the last thing I'd say is my best days at work are when I see someone else do something amazing. And, and I have to sit down and silently, like, like just be excited for what they're doing and what they're bringing to the world. And, you know, if I did some small thing to help enable them, great. But really, the joy I get out of work is, is seeing the progress of, of tens of thousands of brilliant people, you know, working hard every day. And that's, that's probably what my best day is. Well, Mike Schroepfer, thank you so much for, for joining us here. I'm afraid virtually at the Oxford Union this evening. You can see there are so many more questions that I wish I could ask and that our members could as well. And so 
hopefully when the world opens up again, you will choose to actually be able to come and join us and not just a, a hologram of you. Love to. Um, yeah, I love until, the questions. <laughs> until then, thank you so much for joining us and thank you everybody else for watching. Have a lovely evening.